recording again. Okay. Stu, would you introduce today's speaker, Dr. Herbst? Sure, I'd be very glad to do this. Susan, welcome. Um, Susan Herbst. <laughs> uh, Susan Herbst is the university professor of political science and uh, president emeritus at the at UConn, you know, uh, University of Connecticut. She served as the uh, 15th president of the University of Connecticut from 2011 to 2019 and returned to the faculty of political science in, in 2019. Prior to her appointment to the presidency, Susan served as provost, dean, and department chair at multiple universities across the nation. Born in New York City, raised in Peekskill, New York, she received her BA in political science from Duke University, North Carolina, and her PhD from the University of Southern California's Edinburgh School of Communication. Uh, she joined Northwestern University as an assistant professor in, in eight, 1989, remained there until 2003. She is a scholar of public opinion, media, and American politics. Her new book, forthcoming from the University of Chicago Press, is Touched by Birth, the 1930s, and American Public Opinion. In this talk today, um, Professor Herp, Susan Herp, will discuss some of the recent developments in American national politics with a focus on our institutions, public opinion, and the media. Is democracy itself headed towards disaster, or are we already in the so-called constitutional crisis that we hear about all the time? Uh, she will bring what we know from political science and her own observations as a scholar of political culture and history. So this should be really, really interesting. Susan, thanks for being with us. I really, we really appreciate that. And the stage is yours. Oh, thanks so much, Stu. It's, it's wonderful to be here and great to see such a, um, a big crowd early on a Thursday morning. Um, things are going well at UConn, by the way, if you're wondering how the universities are faring, um, at least uh, here at UConn and in Connecticut, we're doing really well. Um, haven't had any big problems or outbreaks at the Stanford campus. So uh, really incredibly proud of the students and um, how they're following all the rules about being vaccinated, wearing their masks, so forth. So um, you'll be glad to know education continues and uh, students are just so happy to be back um, for in-person uh, learning. Uh, and uh, it's, it's been a real pleasure to watch them um, in their maturity as they, they kind of adjust to a um, hopefully temporarily um, new world. So thanks a lot for having me. Uh, I just thought I would create a, a kind of a, you know, David Letterman type list. See, I could say David Letterman to this crowd because you remember him. Um, in class, I have a problem with the, uh, you know, references that are, are before, you know, 2010. They kind of go over the students' heads. But uh, so it's nice to have a a crowd that um, has a little more history and, and remembers um, at least the last few decades. Uh, but thought I would talk about 10 political dynamics to watch in no particular order as we lurch toward the midterm elections in uh, 2022 and also the presidential election in 2024. It sounds like a long way off, but as you, you all know, um, the time passes really quickly. Uh, so I'll give some views that are based on data uh, which political scientists are still collecting in trying to understand the contemporary scene. Um, I'll talk a little bit about history, at least um, the periods that I know well, uh, and then uh, constitutionality and just just some uh, some comments from my gut. I'm just watching, and and so uh, I'll I'll keep it relatively short. I hope that we can spend most of our time on discussion uh, questions and looking forward to your insights. Uh, I have to teach this stuff, so I'm always open for uh, new perspectives, new ideas, um, as we try to orient students toward the kind of political culture that they've landed in and that they'll see, uh, at least for, this, uh, for the first years of their adult life. Um, so number one, I might as well uh, get to this first and get past it uh, or get, get it over with, um, and that's about uh, President Trump, um, or as Biden calls him, the former guy. Um, so Trump, the man, the movement, obviously we can't read Trump's mind, although that's become a major aspect of American journalism 
these days. But um, barring any major health problems, I'd say there's a very good chance, excellent chance that Trump will run again. Um, he, at first, I, I mean, for a while, I thought that he might just hint at running for a long time until he actually has to declare uh, and get into some debates. Uh, then he'd say he's not running, then have tryouts in a kind of apprentice style um, where candidates vie for his endorsement. And then he chooses the one who you know, most uh, pleases him. But I've changed my mind on that. I think he really is running. He's raising a lot of money. Uh, and um, there is his pride about having been ousted. And I think he wants to um, overcome that and get back in, get back in power. Uh, and very importantly, he's way out ahead on all polls against all possible Republican challengers. And it's hard to imagine anyone challenging him effectively at this point. You know, everything can change. We've seen so much fluidity on the political scene that anything's possible. Uh, but as of now, I think there's a very good chance he's running. Um, and, and all other candidates um, have it tough. Uh, it's very hard for them, probably near impossible for them to raise money from the um, the kind of the usual suspect Republican donors um, because they don't know who to put their money on. And I imagine that if Trump found out that um, that any you know possible contenders to run against him were raising money, um, he would put a kibosh on that and wouldn't feel too great about it. So uh, he you know, controls all the levers right now. And um, most candidates who are running, they, they would be raising a lot of money by now, but they're probably unable to do much of that at all. Um, so that's, that's number one is we got to, uh, you know, keep our eyes on Trump uh, because what he does is, is really what the Republican party will do. It's not a particularly divided party um, as you've seen. Uh, it's it's pretty monochromatic right now. Um, number two, uh, so now we'll get into the political science research um, a bit. Uh, the rise of Trump, Trumpism, and what he sort of enabled in public discourse and political behavior, um, it turns out to be primarily about race and um, racial hatred, racial strife, um, people's discomfort with race. Uh, it took a while, took a few years, um, as it does in social science, but now we have a lot of data, um, very fine-tuned data on who voted for Trump, who supported him, who worked for him as volunteers, who went to the rallies, so forth. Uh, we have lots of big quantitative data sets um, that are, like I said, very refined, very sophisticated. And then there are people out there who've done a lot of qualitative interviews and focus group testing um, to try to figure out what happened in 2015, 2016, and, and all the way to present. Um, so there's demographic data about who voted him, who supported him, um, and also opinion data and attitude surveying. Uh, not all the people, as you know, I'm sure from your uh, daily goings about, uh, not all people who voted for Trump either once or twice did so on the basis of racial fear and resentment. So it's not true for every, every pocket of the electorate that voted for him, but many, many did, uh, particularly in the white working class, which is a population of great interest uh, because Obama did penetrate that block um, and get a lot of votes uh, in 2008, 2012. Um, I don't know if you remember during the 2008 campaign, uh, how much attention there was on places like um, Western Pennsylvania, um, where Obama, you know, managed to um, even, you know, given that he was African American, given that he was a Democrat, you know, he managed to get that white working class vote. And it was, you know, it was critical. Um, to pushing him over the top, and uh, that that was a you know one of the areas to watch if you're interested in this particular question. Um, surprising to a lot of us is just how clear and strong the evidence is about race. You know, it's not that, and this was the hypothesis before that it was white working class voted for Trump and supported him because they had lost jobs or were in some kind of income compression where they didn't have opportunity to move up and you know, realize the next you know, level of the, the American dream. Um, no, 
uh, really that hypothesis just absolutely pales um, in comparison to um, people's voting on, on race. Um, so there was a lot, there were a lot of people um, again in white working class in particular uh, voting on racial fear, um, fear of African Americans or Mexicans, uh, fear that immigrants will take our jobs, although you know they, they don't, they haven't. Um, more important that they will change American culture in some fundamental way. And I'll get to that a little bit more later. Um, also that um, people of color, minorities will get benefits that we don't get. They somehow get a leg up um, through affirmative action that whites um, have not had, have never had, that it's not a fair fight. It's not a level playing ground. Uh, there's really not the kind of opportunity that one should expect in a working democracy because of race. Uh, and um, there's a lot of zero sum logic in much of this thinking with many whites believing that if a minority uh, citizen um, or person of color gets a benefit or an opportunity, that's one less opportunity for them. So a lot of that zero sum thinking. Um, in fact, in 2016, uh, the, the first um, you know, Trump campaign, most people who said their finances were poor or getting worse voted for Hillary Clinton. Um, so that that kind of data are, are very telling. Uh, so, you know, importantly, and this is something we still work on, is trying to tease out um, where the race is coming from. You know, how much of it is toward immigrants, how much of it is toward Native uh, African Americans or Latinos, but it's kind of projected on immigrants. So um, there's still work to do on that, but mostly right now, just reading the the, um, the studies that are coming out myself, um, it looks like a lot of people put all of those kind of people in co of color, whether they come as um, immigrants or whether they are native born African Americans or Latinos, putting them in the same general category as the other. And you know that's the kind of language that we use in academe. Um, it sounds you know super general uh, and it is, but it is because you know so many. There are so many cross wires here, um, where there's a lot of projecting of people's discomfort, say about African Americans, onto the immigration crisis and onto the um, to problems of refugees. So this is pretty tough uh, stuff to disentangle. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, I think you can you can see, um, you know, by close attention to, to media, how this stuff slips and slides around. And uh, we can talk about critical race theory um, if you'd like later. It's something that I uh, talked to my class about yesterday. And I think critical race theory, which you're going to hear a lot about in the next few years, is a good bucket. It's a good uh, bucket for a lot of racism to settle in in a way that seems acceptable um, to, to a lot of people. Uh, so that's a kind of interesting part of public discourse that's gonna play out. And I think that the Republicans will um, try to run on cultural issues more than COVID, more than the economy, more than foreign policy. Uh, but again, we could talk about that later. Um, just a historical note, my new book is about the 1930s, a public opinion in the 1930s. And one of the things I learned in um, you know, deep dive into the 30s is uh, how much uh, people, writers, intellectuals, politicians, um, just the engaged public, how much struggle there was with the essential question of who is truly American? Um, what is the essence of, of being American? Um, the Atlantic uh, back in the 30s even had a contest. They received thousands and thousands of essays from people where they asked, um, asked people to send in essays about what it is to be an American. What is the American way? And they just got too much. It was all over the map. So they um, decided to, to publish some, but they really, they, they, it, it just kind of opened up. It was a great aperture to see um, just how fraught um, this question was how many strong opinions and how much in conflict they really were. Uh, the issue, you know, is in the 30s, it had come to a head in the 30s, um, but really there had been decades before, especially in the teens and the 20s, um, where the United States was flooded with immigrants. Um, there, and there was the great migration of African Americans out of the South, um, fleeing uh, Jim Crow if they could. 
So in 1924, there was the harshest um, immigration law that has ever been implemented in the United States. Uh, and that law in 1924 put quotas on um, all immigrant groups who are very harsh quotas. Um, that said, even with many, many fewer immigrants coming into the United States in the 1920s and into the 1930s, um, prejudice, discrimination, fear, you know, kept on going at a, at a pretty you know, impressive clip. So it's just interesting um, that even with strict controls on, on um, who's coming in, uh, people still feared it tremendously. And again, feared that um, immigrants or others, and I include in there African Americans coming north, um, would somehow change the American way, would threaten what it is to be American, which I think we can, you know, pretty clearly define at that time and even now as um, native born white. Um, so the debate was unsettled in the 1930s, um, infused by a lot of the race anxiety, the hatred, the fear that you see today. Um, these fears are, they seem like they're always with us uh, and um, the errors are different um, in their specifics and their manifestations, but we can draw some pretty straight lines. Uh, number three, uh, polarization. So a lot of smart people in political science study polarization and the political polarization. They've been doing it for a while. You know, we've been studying this really rigorously for decades with a lot of, um, you know, very interesting data and very extensive um, study. Uh, there is right now, I would say it's a cottage industry of political scientists working on the roots of polarization, nature of polarization, a lot of fine books out there. I highly recommend, and I've used it in my course too, um, Ezra Klein's extremely readable book. It's called simply Why We're Polarized. And uh, the nice thing about it is, besides he's a terrific writer, is that he brings together a lot of the social science evidence to explain what's going on with political polarization um, and argues that, uh, and this is what political scientists have um, come to consensus on too, that it's not about the issues, it's not even about ideology, it's become a matter of cultural, we call it sorting or stacking, um, which is also geographic in nature. Uh, so uh, let's ju just uh, say first that um, the, the political class and, you know, best, best exemplified by the House and the Senate um, has been polarized and extreme for a while now, especially the House. Uh, now it's very, very dramatic, but there's been a, a polarization that's pretty easily measured for the last couple of decades, starting with um, Newt Gingrich. Uh, the period of the 90s when Newt Gingrich was um, Speaker of the House is an absolutely critical milestone um, in the polarization of the House and the Senate um, for different reasons. Uh, as you see from watching the news, the number of true moderates is really tiny. Uh, there's a lot of focus on Senators Mansion and Cinema. Uh, there are a few others, but you know the moderates have practically disappeared, at least as we can tell in public. Um, the public has been much slower to polarize. Uh, and so if I were given this talk seven, eight, 10 years ago, I would say, which is the political science consensus was around then, uh, that Congress is very polarized, but the public is not. And we had a lot of evidence for that being true. Um, but what's happened over the last decade is that people started taking their clues from the very polarized elites, the partisan media, uh, cable television, social media, of course. Um, so that led to a more polarized public, but it absolutely was not a bottom down, bottom up phenomenon where Americans got more polarized and then that was reflected in Congress. It's the other way around. So I think that's really important to understand and something that we're absolutely sure of in political science. Um, uh, and there's nothing, uh, there's nothing at all. Um, yeah, so, so um, on this business of sorting and stacking, uh, what it means basically is that, you know, people started to pick teams and then adjust all of their views according to their team over time. Um, so for example, a great example, um, it used to be that uh, it used to be the case for many, many decades that abortion was um, supported 
and opposed across party lines. You know, white working class Catholic Democrats uh, could oppose abortion. Um, moder uh, uh, moderate Northeastern Republicans like George H.W. Bush could support it. Um, so people were crossing lines all the time on issues, abortion being just a, a very obvious one. Uh, that is no longer true at all. Now abortion, like most issues, is sorted on top of party identification. So it's kind of all or nothing. Um, you pick your team, you adjust your views to stay with that team. Not really about ideology, not really about issues. When you dig into it, it's about team membership. Um, one of the reasons I really like the Ezra Klein book is that he um, puts it in sports language, which is something I can, uh, college sports language, which is something I can understand um, and really hit home for me as a, as a Duke alumnus. Uh, he says in the book that, you know, Democrats and Republicans are, are most like Duke and Carolina. You know, they hate each other far more than as kind of logically or, you know, appropriate. And um, they want each other to lose even more than they themselves want to win. And I, you know, I want you to think about that, is that's how fierce the hatred is and the, the kind of the stacking onto your team. They want the other team to lose even more than they wanna win. And I can say as a Duke alum, I do feel that way about Carolina. So, um, so, so something to, to ponder. Um, and so you say, well, it, and, and this is something I see debated on camp, Campbell television all the time is, um, isn't it a matter of the Democrats having to deliver or the Republicans having to deliver on the issues? That is what will keep them strong. That is what will garner votes. That's what helps win elections. And uh, I think we're really starting to get unmoored from that because of this uh, identity politics, identity partisan politics. Um, and this the stacking business. And I mentioned too that the stacking is geographic. Um, and I think you'll see more and more of that where um, certain states get bluer, certain states get redder. Uh, there was a great set of maps in the New York Times yesterday about uh, gerrymandering that's going on in Texas to try to create more red districts, a more sure thing red districts. So uh, I urge you to go take a look at that. It's a lot easier to look in print at it, but. Um, still up, up on the web. Uh, uh, there's a really great essay that a lot of people are talking about from last week. It's by Robert Kagan, uh, he's, a, he's a writer for the Washington Post. And he argues, and I like this essay, I guess, because I've been arguing it too, um, is that we're already in a constitutional crisis. Um, so all this business about, are we rolling toward a constitutional crisis is off. I think we're already in it. Um, my reasons for thinking we're in it is that voting itself is being threatened, um, the insurrection, but even before that, uh, there was a real problem with one of the basic, you know, fundamental um, dynamics of the Constitution, and that's congressional oversight. Um, when you don't have proper congressional oversight, you don't have three branches of government checking and balancing each other at all. Uh, and during the Trump administration, um, members of the Trump administration would just outwardly defy Congress um, in terms of giving them materials for investigations or coming to testify. Uh, and they just, they just wouldn't do it. It would get tied up in court. And we've never seen anything like that before, um, that kind of um, unwillingness to let an, a branch of government do its job at all. So I think that was a moment of where we turned into a constitutional crisis and it's just continued since then. Um, but I like this Kagan piece. Here's a quote from it that it really stood out to me. Um, he says, quote, he writes, quote, uh, there was a time when political analysts wondered what would happen when Trump failed to deliver for his constituents. Uh, but the most important thing Trump delivers is himself. Um, his egomania is part of his appeal. In his professed victimization by the media and elites, his followers see their own victimization. That's why attacks on Trump by the elites only strengthen his bond with his followers. Uh, that's why millions of Trump supporters have even been willing to risk death as part of their show of solidarity. When Trump's enemies cited his mishandling the pandemic to discredit him, their answer was to reject the pandemic. One Trump supporter didn't go to the hospital after developing COVID-19 symptoms because he didn't want to contribute to the liberal cause against Trump. Quote, 
I'm not going to add to the numbers, he told reporters. Uh, so that's a, a kind of a, you know, a, a obviously, a, you know, coming from a, a liberal point of view, um, but I think it, it piles on nicely with this business of sorting that either you're for him or you're against him, either you're with the Republicans or with Democrats. And again, we had not seen anything like this, the totality of partis of polarization in the general population until the last few years. Uh, for social media, something that you've been hearing a lot lately, um, maybe you're you're in social media, it's become a really, it's gone from being a, a fun way for people to connect and a great thing for academics uh, to connect all these years. Uh, but social media has become, you know, a very sober, very grim topic. I used to think that um, the internet on balance was a great thing for democracy. You know, more opinions, more arguments, more ways for activists to mobilize for their causes. Uh, but it's turned out to be far from helpful, as you um, as you see in the headlines. Uh, Facebook turns out to be critical to to cruel, hateful discourse, to the rise of militias, and even planning the January 6th insurrection. There's no editors. There's no fact checking. It's it's an ugly wild west out there. Uh, thankfully or not, um, most people, most all people do not act on things they see in social media. They have opinions, but they, they tend not to act on them. Um, there, uh, there's an old theory, I could talk about it more later if you want. It's back from the 40s in social science about um, media having a kind of a narcotizing effect on us that uh, even though people have very strong opinions, they're really deeply involved in watching MSNBC or Fox News or, or whatever, that they still don't actually get out and do anything. Um, they're radicalized, they're polarized from their couch. Um, and about all they do is vote if that. So I don't know if it's a good or bad thing, but it's something that still, it, it remains true. Um, how and, and how and whether to regulate Facebook and Instagram, complex questions, really high hurdles. So uh, that'll be one of the interesting things to watch over the next few years. And it, it certainly has bipartisan support right now. But as all issues, I'm not sure how that will last. Um, number five, the mainstream media. Uh, covering politics these days is very tough. I'm a huge uh, critic of American journalism, have been my whole career um, on cable and mainstream media. Uh, but these these first few, these last few years are the first time that I've ever felt. Excuse me. Uh, last few years, first time I've ever felt any sympathy for people who try to report on politics in Washington. Um, you know, journalists have found it exceedingly hard to cover the Trump administration. Uh, there's the lack of communication, transparency, um, and just not knowing what to do when leaders lie, you know, when they're, when they're they tell untruths. Um, when the president claimed, uh, last president claimed the pandemic was not so bad, that untested drugs could work, um, that he never threatened the president of the Ukraine. You know, what can a journalist do when there's something just, you know, patently uh, false? Uh, so eventually, and it, it was hard for them, they started calling those lies, they started calling them untruths, but it didn't really help in the coverage that much. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't really make the coverage that much better or that much, um, help more helpful. So like I said, I do um, did find some, uh, certainly some sympathy for them. And it's a question that rolls around in journalism schools right now and in the Washington Press Corps. You know, how do you, um, what do you do when an administration is constantly uh, defying clear facts in a, um, you know, in, a, just in such a, a, a blatant way? Um, I, yeah, and so the, well, there are so many examples, I'll skip those. Um, number six, uh, so I'm getting there, getting to 10, um, our historical struggle with the notion of populism. So we used to look back at, at different periods in the United States in the 1890s, um, when the first really big wave of populism began. And then in the 1930s is also a high time for populism. Um, and we look back on all that as kind of ancient history. 
Um, in the 30s, uh, FDR had you know, populism on his right and left, which was looking really dangerous to him. Um, he had Father Coughlin on the right, uh, you know, kind of spewing hatred, anti-Semitism on the radio. Father Coughlin through the 30s, extraordinarily popular with tens of millions of listeners um, to his his radio show, he started to peter out um, by the end of the 1930s. He mostly self-destructed because the anti-Semitism got so incredibly fierce that um, even anti-Semitic people, I guess, didn't didn't want to um, hear the extremity of it. Uh, and then the you know the rise of Hitler um, being a, a problem for Father Coughlin as he tried to get his American story straight. Um, so, but Father Coughlin, a huge um, danger to to FDR. Uh, in the 30s, uh, a real populist hero. And then on FDR's left, uh, Huey Long, the, um, the governor turned senator um, from Louisiana who promised, uh, he had a, a great movement, again, of tens of millions of people um, who followed his writings, listened to him on the radio. And uh, Huey Long argued that there should be, for example, a, a guaranteed annual income, that every American should get a car and, um, and money and um, uh, all kinds of benefits just automatically for being American. Um, so that was a very dangerous FDR thought. A populist movement that was unworkable. Um, FDR got a break in that Huey Long was assassinated in the early 30s. Um, so even though he had huge, um, huge popularity, uh, he was his, he was pretty much erased to FDR's um, relief, no doubt. Uh, and then FDR is called a populist, which um, to me seems not quite right, given what he faced on the extreme right, extreme left that really did look like populism as we understand it. Um, so what does populism look like now? Uh, it's a it's an open question. You know, populism is the general argument that the people must rule, but who are they? Uh, it seems that um, a lot of those in power um, push for the people, the working class, but um, so much of their public policy uh, does not necessarily reflect that. So it's a, a question that we bat around in, in political science all the time. You know, how do the people get represented? Um, and uh, is populism necessarily a bad thing? It sort of depends on, on who's making the argument and what they're producing by way of public policy. Um, so I think it's something to watch uh, as we did over the last few years and as we will in 2022 and 2024 is um, who's the real genuine populist? Is that attractive or appropriate for, for us? And what, what kind of faux populism are we seeing? And um, do people view that as hypocritical or are they just numbed to the rhetoric somehow? Um, number seven, anti-intellectualism and science. You know, I don't have to explain to you how how attractive that has been recently to so many Americans. Um, it's getting extremely worrisome uh, now that it, it it there are now that it has invaded the public health space. Um, you know, all our lives are are at risk uh, with people not following public health. Uh, mandates and guidance. It's something we have not seen before in the United States to this extent. There have always been anti-vaxxers. There have always been anti-intellectuals. There have always been people who question science, but never like this, never even close to this. Um, in the th 1930s, in the 1920s and the 1930s, interestingly, um, science was having a tough go of it. Um, for a variety of reasons, scientists were kind of having trouble explaining why uh, especially um, pure science or uh, non-applied science, but also applied science was important, why it needed to be funded, why it could fix things, why it, science, how science could change the world. Um, and so there was a kind of a struggle in the, in the 20s and the 30s about that, but it pretty much stopped in the 1950s with Ike. And um, again, you know, back in the in the fifties, both Republicans and Democrats could believe in building our scientific infrastructure, public health infrastructure, and um, we have to thank uh, Eisenhower for so much um, government 
is so many government institutions um, built for the express purpose of uh, basic science and also applied science. Also, you know, in the 50s, particular in the 40s, into the 50s in particular, applied science and manufacturing and the fact that, um, you know, scientists could create, uh, engineers could create so many, you know, great uh, automotive, uh, you know, breakthroughs and breakthroughs in appliances and home heating and air conditioning, you know, all the all the stuff that we were buying um, in the 50s and that American manufacturing was making um, really helped science along. Uh, that's taken a really bad turn in the last 10 years. And again, you see it playing out before your eyes. It's not new in America. Um, there is a, just a wonderful book. It's probably one of my favorite, my top 10 books of, um, of history uh, by Richard Hofstetter called uh, Anti-Intellectualism um, in American Life. And he traces anti-intellectualism back from colonial days. And it's, it's a beautiful book. He's a, he's a fabulous writer. It's a big fat book <laughs> in case you're looking for something um, that's gonna, gonna take you a while. Um, but Hofstetter tries to you know, draw that straight line. I think he's right. It's always been there. It's just a matter of how much play it gets. Um, all right, let me finish up quickly so we have time here. Uh, number eight, civility. Um, there's there's something happening the last few years, especially the last six years, that is is really disturbing. It's kind of incivility that we haven't seen ever before that we didn't expect. No doubt, a lot of it is um, enhanced and helped along by social media, but that's social media is not enough to explain it. Um, there's a kind of a cruelty in the incivility that um, is new to us. Uh, I wrote a book on civility 10 years ago, uh, 11 years ago. And in that book, I argued that everybody just needs to have a tougher skin. I mean, back then I was writing about Sarah Palin and, and um, the Tea Party. Uh, I, don't, I couldn't write that book today. I don't think I could hold up that argument today. Hopefully other book parts of the book are useful, but that th particular thesis that um, people just need to, need to learn how to argue and not be so personally hurt by um, political assaults. Um, I don't think that's true anymore because the nature of the discourse, the nature of the assaults is so much worse. And the, the, what is truth has, has been challenged so grateful, uh, greatly. Um, I, don't, I don't find the incivility to be equal on both sides exactly, um, but you can, certainly, you can certainly find it on both sides. Um, and I, you know, I worry that we've got one party that's, that's really uh, you know, quite a mess with regard to incivility, um, but the Democrats have their incivility as well. Um, I was shocked by this one the other day uh, that I didn't expect. Uh, this is from the, the Times. Uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren on Tuesday said she opposed a second term for uh, Fed Reserve Chair Jerome Powell, calling him a dangerous man because of the federal, uh, because of the financial regulations that have been loosened during his tenure. Quote, your record gives me grave concern, um, Warren told Powell while he was testifying before the Senate Banking Committee. Over and over, you have acted to make our banking system less safe, and that makes you a dangerous man to head up the Fed. And that's why we'll oppose your renomination. You know, that's a bit much. It is not civil to call him a dangerous man. I think we can all agree on that. I'm not sure how we unwind all this, how we regain the notion that Americans are kind, that we're open, that we're friendly, because I'm not sure that we are anymore. And it's, um, it's really hard to say that. Uh, it's hard to talk about with students. Um, we had a great discussion in my class last week about um, whether anything could um, pull us together as a nation anymore, even a threat like COVID didn't pull us together. Uh, and could we ever sacrifice for the larger good ever again? Um, and we were discussing uh, World War II at the time. And I think the whole class agreed that we couldn't win that war today because nobody on the home front would make those kind of sacrifices, any, everything from rationing to letting your son um, go overseas to fight a war uh, that wasn't kind of directly affecting you on a day-to-day -day basis. So, I, you know, that's a pretty stunning thing to think about. We couldn't even mobilize for a war effort like the Second World War. I think it's, it's, it's pretty cut and dry. 
Um, number nine, so I'm getting there. Uh, why be in Congress? Um, why is this body seemingly made up of individuals and not coalitions? Why are we thinking and seeing so much about Congress? In the past, uh, we weren't that focused on the legislative branch, um, but we are now because it seems to matter a lot and it's gotten even more worrisome, more cruel, more color colorful and, and more polarized. And uh, you wonder how this body sustains, um, in particular, why be in Congress? Uh, it's something that um, a lot of us wonder when we see what goes on in, the, in that body. And more importantly, why the best people in this nation are not running for office, are not in Congress, are not in the Senate. You know, absolutely, it's true for our legislature too. There's some very, um, you know, excellent people um, who are in the legislature for the right reasons, but there's a lot of people who are not in it for the right reasons um, and really seem to be acting um, just, you know, for themselves and their uh, individual success. And uh, we had a great book in the 1960s. Oh, I always keep it really close by. Um, because it's one of the most important books in political science. It's um, David Mayhew's uh, um, uh, uh, Congress, The Electoral Connection. Um, so it's from the early 60s. And uh, David Mayhew is still active and uh, working at Yale, uh, one of our best minds in political science. Um, Mayhew wrote back in the early 60s that um, the main goal of any legislator is to stay in office and you can trace his or hers activities, even if they seem issue oriented, they're really about just staying in office. So at the time the book came out, people thought that was a pretty cynical way to see things, um, uh, but now it, it more than rings true. And I, I highly recommend this a readable, beautiful book by um, one of our best living political scientists. Um, Number 10, uh, oh, I guess I talked about um, that we're already in a, uh, a constitutional crisis. So I somehow got to 10 <laughs> back on number two or three. So um, I think, I think I'll stop there. Uh, I just, I decided to, instead of making one argument for, for 40 minutes, just to throw a lot of um, interesting stuff out there, see what people um, want to engage on and see if we can't um, find some good news in this for all my students who are, I can promise you, they're still kids. I mean, uh, the great thing about teaching undergraduates and spending your whole life with undergraduates as I have is that, um, and they're always, you know, they're always the same age. <laughs> you know, every year you show up, they're always the same age and they're always um, so effervescent. Just... They, always, they always think they can change the world um, and they still have that even with, with all the cynicism around us. So I want to assure you that they're listening and uh, we got to give them some good news. So thanks, Stu. I'll stop there. Susan, thank you very, very much. It's really a lot to think of. It's a lot. <laughs> I wanna, I wanna, I'll, there's a lot of questions. Um, um, I'll just mention to the guys, uh, ask your question, no political opinion, please. Um, if you have a second question, raise your hand again. Um, but I'm going to start off with one you just kind of recently mentioned. How do politicians uh, survive when they're obviously not really representing what the constituency wants? You hear these polls about how people feel about abortion and other things, um, but yet the politicians don't, don't follow through with what the constituency wants. Yeah, I think there's two things and that, it, remember I talked about the stacking um, uh, and the sorting. I think that the stacking and sorting and the I'm with my team no matter what happens has really overcome issues as the way people think of themselves politically and the way they vote. So that's what we're worried about in political science right now is that, that used to be, it used to be the case that people would vote on some issues, not, not all. I mean, people never vote on foreign policy, not even during the Vietnam War. Um, so, you know, nobody's gonna vote on our, our pulling out of Afghanistan or anything like that. Uh, but people used to vote somewhat on issues and now it's just, it's all this, this team stuff. Um, in addition to the, uh, the gerrymandering that we have uh, that is making it really impossible for to have contested elections in a lot of districts, 
and the incumbent advantage. Um, there is very, very little turnover in Congress. I know that um, it looks like uh, in some years there's been substantial turnover, but on the whole, uh, incumbents get reelected. Uh, so once somebody's in office, it's pretty easy for them to uh, work their district um, or their state um, to make the public think that either they are working on those issues or they're not really issues for your party. So, you know, let go of it. Thank you. Um, first question, uh, we have a lot of questions. Uh, Arcady. He's muted. Yeah. Unmute. Okay. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. yes. yes okay. Sir. So, in sorry, in 1965, Lyndon Johnson passed legislation war on poverty, and according to Senator Moynihan, this program destroyed nuclear uh, family of blacks or African Americans and trapped them in poverty and, uh, and many generation uh, grew up with very low uh, graduation rate from high school. And so, so in terms of social standing, they fall behind. But if you mention that, you are announced as racist. So how this problem can be fixed uh, uh, really if it cannot be named? Um, well, I don't know that, uh, you know, that that's necessary. I mean, I'm not a sociologist, so I, you know, I'm just nearly not qualified to talk too much about the war on poverty. But, um, you know, I'm with you. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of leading um, scholars of color um, would would agree that the kind of discussions that, say, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who um, talked a lot about this and wrote a lot about it in the 60s um, and into the 70s, um, that we are, we should be able to talk about the roots of poverty. Um, you know, people like Barack Obama or Reverend Al Sharpton, you know, they're happy to, you know, our some of our leading Black political voices, they're happy to talk about it too. Um, but they need it to be talked about in a, you know, way that's close to facts, um, that's not infused with racism, that is really open and, you know, not threatening to people. And, you know, having that discussion is just really hard right now. So, I, you know, I, I think that a lot of people agree with you that we should be able to study these, you know, sociological phenomena so that we can move forward. Uh, but it's not not a great time for serious discussion like that. It, we just can't seem to manage it without a lot of cruelty and so forth. Okay, thank you. And your, your presentation is great. It's really good. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, uh, Steve Cole. Yes, uh, the, the great weakness of monarchy has always been line of succession. And uh, it seems like uh, we have the same kind of a problem with the uh, great populace. I mean, nobody followed up after Huey Long, Father Coughlin. How likely do you think that there's going to be a successful MAGA handoff when uh, Trump finally goes? Uh, I, you know, that is a huge open question for people in the social sciences is can the movement last without the man? And um, I tend to think not. Um, it will, absolutely, there's a core of people who have now kind of grown up with um, that man and Trumpism and the excitement of it. I mean, one of my students um, in, in class had gone to a Trump rally a couple of years ago, and he said, this kid said, it was the most exciting, he didn't agree with it, he was just going for, you know, some just participant observation, and uh, he said it was the most intense, exciting thing he'd ever event he'd ever been to it was beyond a rock concert or an amazing football game I mean it was crazy and people were having so much fun and you can't downplay you know how many especially men but also women 
um, in their 20s, in their te late teens and 20s, um, got uh, radicalized by that or got excited about it. Um, you could say looking at it, got engaged by it, if you want to put a positive slant on it. So there is a sector of people who come to expect that that kind of circus is what po American politics is, and it makes them really excited and happy. So that's there. Um, I don't know what happens to those people, but I, you know, there's no question that that MAGA is, you know, it's it's very centered around a man and his, you know, just incredible uh, charisma. And, uh, you know, you may or may not feel it, but I think it's, it's undeniable. I and mean, it's really, really hard to become the president of the United States. <laughs> and he did. So there's, um, there's a lot to, you know, to unpack there in terms of uh, what he is capable of. A lot of people argue rightfully that um, the kind of resentments and racism, things that an unhappiness, disappointment that Trump enabled, that he brought to the surface, it was there. But I don't hear many people arguing that it would have come out anyway. I mean, I think most people see Trump as a vital linchpin in this. And you can't think of another way it would have come up like this. Thank you. Uh, Joe Andriana. Hey, Dr. Herbst, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, you mentioned critical race theory and hear a lot about it being uh, in schools and grammar schools and public schools. What is critical race theory in a nutshell? Sure, thanks. And um, by the way, I, okay, here's my prediction about 2022 and 24 at this moment is that Democrats are gonna try to run on issues. They're gonna run on that they control COVID, um, some of the infrastructure that they'll get passed and social programs and the economy. And Republicans will run on critical race theory and abortion. Um, and so a lot of Democratic consultants right now are trying to you know, slap Democrats in the face and say, look, while you're talking about all these things, they're going cultural on the culture wars. And uh, that's, that's, um, that often wins the day. Now, um, critical race theory, so it started out in the you know, 70s and the 80s uh, in, in law, in law schools um, by a few law professors um, who were simply writing. I mean, their work is, is good and scholarly, but it's, it was really pretty simple that um, people who study the law and who practice the law, but especially scholars of the law, people who become law professors, uh, that they really should um, evaluate the law and the constitutionality of law, the institutions that enforce the law, and look at them through the rate, through the lens of social justice and race discrimination. Um, that we should look at, for example, our laws on um, housing and uh, you know, the regulation of, of housing and zoning, that we should look at those laws in light of the kind of anti-Semitism or racism that was inherent in uh, the United States at that moment in that locality. Um, so it really was meant to be a lens, you know, a mechanism for looking at uh, the law, its effectiveness, its fairness. And it was in a law school, uh, one of many, many, lenses for looking at the law. Um, and, and so that's, that's the way it was. Somehow it got picked up by, there are a few kind of right wing intellectuals, uh, you know, pundits who picked it up more recently to, to argue that critical race theory is, it's everywhere, it's invaded academe, and that they say that critical race theory is about saying America is racist and that our history is racist, that um, the founding fathers were racist, that race is the only thing that has really driven uh, the nature of American history and politics. So um, people have distorted this, you know, what was a kind of a scholarly lens um, to use to look at the world and distorted it into something that sounds incredibly threatening. And uh, what's weird to people like me and sociologists is that we've always looked at the United States at American history and American politics through all kinds of lenses, um, through race, through the economy, through anti-Semitism, through um, you know, you know, where people live and how people have geographically settled. You know. uh, so 
it's it's very strange those of us in academe watching how this got completely distorted but the way they say it sounds pretty scary to the average american and um who has children in school who they these these the folks who have distorted it say um the kids in school are going to not learn anything good about america they're only going to learn that america is a racist country um, you know, I think the best statement on this, I mean, I should record it or, you know, I should have it handy on my computer, is when uh, General Milley went before the Senate, I can't remember which committee he was uh, in front of, maybe it was two weeks ago, and um, they're questioning him on all kinds of things, including, you know, Afghanistan, um, but they also, one of the senators asked him about critical race theory and why it was being taught at West Point, um, and General Milley said, I think it's great that it's being taught in the military and taught at West Point. I mean, I have read Marx, I've read Lenin, I've read Mao, um, I've read Hitler. You know, I, I think it's really important for us to understand if we're going to understand American history and how to make this, you know, a better place. It's important to look at all of our institutions, including the military, through these different, you know, theoretical lenses. And um, that really, you know, like, I can't remember which senator asked him that, but it really shut him down because um, Millie's a real intellectual. It's very impressive. Yeah, you know, just just the, you're talking to an audience today that uh, most of us uh, have lived through race uh, problems. So yeah, thank you for that answer. I appreciate one. They talk about it now. Uh, you know, what's, what's one of the things that's really nice about my class, which is undergraduates right now, is I have a couple of older students um, who are just coming back to audit the class who already had professional careers. And uh, one of them is in his 80s. Um, and he's just, he's fabulous because, you know, the, he helps me give students um, historical perspective. Um, but he also has broken the news to the students that, you know, the racial strife has not gotten a lot better. In <laughs> fact, you know, he might think it got worse. So that really, that brings down their mood. Um, but, uh, you know, he's just somebody who's seen a lot like you have and wonders aloud, you know, how much progress we're really making. Next question, Rich Agustin. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Herbst. I really enjoyed your comments. You mentioned the, um, const whether we're in a constitutional constitutional crisis already and the role of con uh, Congress oversight, congressional oversight in that. So we've got now the committee, January 6th committee that's issued a subpoenas, I guess 15 or more, but four critical ones. One of, one of which at least has already said they're not gonna respond. And I'm sure that others will also say they're not gonna respond. What do you think is gonna happen with that? What should the committee do with that? What's the implications of that playing out one way or the other? Yeah, so this will be interesting to watch. But now that the Democrat, now that the Biden administration is here and the Justice Department um, is different, uh, they can enforce the subpoenas. I mean, the Justice Department can suppose. Um, I don't know who's who are they calling? Like uh, uh, Mark uh, Meadows. Kev, Kev, right, right, right. Mark Meadows, the um, the former uh, presidential chief of staff. Um, if they call Meadows and he won't come. I mean, there'll be some wrangling with lawyers, but, you know, in theory, the Justice Department could go have him arrested for contempt of Congress. Now, that's something that Bill Barr probably wouldn't, I mean, wasn't willing to do. Not probably, he wasn't willing to do. Um, and again, it just kind of rolled around with lawyers and then, then it died. But um, yeah, so that's, you know, the Justice Department is critical in so many ways in our life, but, you know, they are also critical to, actually enforcing the checks and balances. Do you, um, do you think the committee will refer to DOJ and do you think DOJ will act and what happens if they don't act? I think they will act. Uh, and I, I think, I mean, I think that they'll, they'll say to Mark, you, met, you know, they will say, look, you're in contempt of Congress and you could be arrested and we're really gonna do it. I think then probably he'll come to Congress. I mean, he may not be very forthcoming and he's all lawyered up and so forth, but um, you know, these, there's a way to scare these guys and the DOJ um, in a democratic administration for the next three years is scary to them. They can only you know, drag out so long. 
But I think Merrick Garland is, is, is very serious about this stuff. And, um, you know, just like the Supreme Court, you know, he worries about the legitimacy of his institution and its ability to, to enforce what is constitutional. Thank you. Uh, Bill Johnson. <clears throat> yeah, if, first a comment that if they're going to arrest people for contempt of Congress, the jails aren't going to be big enough. <laughs> That's number one. Uh, I grew up and my formative years were in the 30s and 40s. And um, we weren't too concerned with this immigration thing. And today, I look at it and I say, gee, you know, I wonder if this is more of an urban versus non-urban situation because uh, having grown up with a father from Maine and a mother from Texas, um, I've lived through both. And it seems that the urban is a much more competitive environment. And so people uh, don't wanna change their culture as much as non-urban who really are looking to help everybody. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I think it's the other way around. At least the data show it's the other way around. And again, gets back to this business of stacking and geographic sorting in particular, um, that they're finding that people in rural areas are much more opposed to immigration uh, than people in cities. And so that's that's the way it looks now. Um, again, you know, it's not everybody in the cities that's open to immigrants and not everybody in the country who's not open to them. But on the whole, um, the, you know, red state, rural, um, you know, support for Trump, anti-immigration, you know, that stuff is starting to, to sort pretty cleanly. Again, back in the, you know, for shorthand to the Duke Carolina problem, <laughs> what do you call it? Well, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of familiar with the basketball simile there. Uh, but um, I believe that uh, uh, you've got it wrong. I think you're looking at um, today and projecting it back on the past rather than on the past and projecting it onto the future. Um, I just uh, haven't uh, found it that way. So. Well, I, I will tell you the small towns, you know, so when I was president of UConn, I lived up in stores on campus for, for those eight years. And uh, if you've been up there, you know that some of those towns in Eastern Connecticut are so wiped out. I mean, they are so poor, they have so little. The town right next to stores, next to Mansfield is called Willimantic. And that's just, that's one of the, the saddest main streets that used to be a really thriving place. Um, at the turn of the century and even into the, the teens and the 20s. Um, towns like those in Eastern Connecticut, you know, when I would drive through them, I just, you know, I would think to myself that they need immigrants. You know, Im immigration is one of the things that will save these towns. Who is gonna move up, up here, you know, and build, um, and build these places up? We have plenty of room in America. At least we have plenty of room in, um, in uh, Northeastern um, Connecticut. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how, how things play out. And uh, we'll, we'll get more data on how people feel about immigration, uh, whether it's from Mexico, Latin America, Haiti, um, people fleeing places like Afghanistan um, over the next few years as this crisis and immigration continues and, and refugees. So I think there's a lot of, you know, kind of open-ended questions. Um, I, I, remember, I think, the, remember, in the, remember in the 30s though, there wasn't much immigration because that 1924 act um, had put such harsh quotas on every single immigrant population. And you remember the famous case of the, the St. Louis, remember the boat, um, uh, coming from Europe full of uh, German Jewish refugees and the St. Louis had tried to dock in Cuba and South America, uh, the United States and the United States, you know, we turned them back. You know, FDR turned them back. Um, so yeah, it was, it was hard to get in on the thirties. But see, that was, as I recall, that was more of the urban population that turned them back. 
you know, it was the, you know, it was the Roosevelt administration and it's something we talked about in my class yesterday <laughs> is, and it's a it kind of a great unsettled question, whether Roosevelt's administration was just reflecting the kind of anti-Semitism that's deep in the texture of American culture, uh, whether he was worried, most likely worried about the distraction from the war effort um, or, or what? I mean, he was a humane actor on most other dimensions. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt wanted the St. Louis to dock in the United States. And um, FDR, despite the pleading of so many um, Jewish leaders and intellectuals, he wouldn't have it. So he not a great not a great refugee record for FDR. I, I agree with that. <laughs> Bill, Bill, thank you. Uh, Bob Rosenthal's last question. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned the Robert Kagan article in, in the Washington Post, one of the most depressing things I have ever read. <laughs> he ends that article with the suggestion that the way to get out of this problem is if moderate Republicans in the Senate, if there are still any, could join with Democrats backing HR1 or something similar to, to save the voting systems from these states. Is there any possibility that this will happen? Uh, it doesn't look good, but I will tell you who I'm watching and I'm, I'm worried is Mitt Romney. Um, I thought that Mitt Romney and a few others, maybe Bob Portman from Ohio, since he's leaving uh, the Senate anyway, um, a couple of others, I thought they would speak out and give some permission, give some room for a few of the other moderates, you know, Susan Collins, I don't expect any anything like this from her, um, maybe the senator from Alaska. Uh, but I, I thought Mitt Romney would be out in front on this one. And I think he's key. Uh, I don't know what to expect. But I, you know, if, if someone like him um, does not step up, and I think he has tremendous amount of credibility, if he chooses not to use it on the right to vote, um, we have a problem. You know, a lot of analysts argue, and a lot of political scientists do too, that um, all these anti-voting regulations, they're horrible. We'd rather not have them. We wanna make voting as easy as possible for people, but that we still have the essential issue of turnout. And that regardless of what happens in these different states, if the Democrats can figure out how to get out the vote, these laws won't matter that much. So um, we need people arguing, we need more Stacey Abrams type, get down on the ground and try to, you know, try to mobilize the vote, then that will overcome all of these, you know, these pretty nasty anti-voting rules. So that's, that's one way to hope to. A lot of people say it's in the hands of a lot of young people who usually don't vote. I mean, they're the worst voters are people in their 20s. Um, and if they could somehow get politically engaged, um, that, that that would change America too, but they're, they're hard to depend on. Yep. Somebody needs to scare them back to the voting booth, that's for sure, because it's a scary situation. I do. I have a lot of hope in the young people today. I mean, if you'd hear my undergraduates, I think you, and this is, well, I'm glad I'm in this profession because uh, they are, they're, they're engaging, they're engaging in their own ways. I mean, one of the things I argue about with them all the time is that expression and argument on social media is not exactly political behavior. Like you do have to get out there, learn about candidates. You have to get out there and vote and organize and pay attention to local issues. Um, what, you know, arguing with each other over Facebook, it's not, it's not really going anywhere in terms of changing your environment. I'm very impressed by I have several students in my class who are really into the Stanford mayor's race. Um, and they know all about it and they know a lot of the issues and they know when the debates are going to be. And I was, that was, this is the first time in my entire teaching career I have ever seen students in a class interested in a local mayor's race. Um, that made me very hopeful. I thought that was very cool. Good, good. Uh, 
Susan, thank you very, very much. It's a wonderful presentation. Uh, I, I thought, I'm sure the guys thought it was very insightful, informative, interesting, um, generating a lot of thought, provoking a lot of thought from a lot of areas. So thanks again. And thank you. Appreciate your being here. Um, Joe, back to you. Thanks. Thank thanks you, Stu. Yeah. Susan, thank you so much for being with thank us you. today. My pleasure. And uh, hopefully the next time we get you to talk to us, uh, it's going to be live. I'm ready, I'm ready to come in person when you guys start meeting in person and happy to talk about other things like um, higher education uh, and, um, and, and always UConn sports. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everybody. All right, guys. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, with the number of people that we've had, uh, maybe we'll fill everybody up and everybody will get a chance next week at 60 uh, limitations. So please look for the emails that are coming on how to uh, join us uh, at a live meeting. And uh, I wasn't planning on being here next week. But uh, due to some circumstances, uh, we're going to have to cancel our trip. So I'm looking forward to be at our first live meeting in almost uh, better, more than a year and a half. So stay well, stay healthy, stay tuned for the emails that are coming. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you.